Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune and a very, very, very special guest. Newly committed four-star safety out of Boxite, Arkansas, Marcus Wimberly. Marcus, welcome to the show. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. I love the background, by the way. That's freaking sweet. <laughs> hey, Hayes did a great job for sure. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So how? Let's talk about it. The visit, the commitment. I know. Hang on, hang on. Before we dive into that, let's let's set the scene for because I know there will be people tuning that's into what, the podcast that aren't familiar with Marcus. So that's kind of what I was about to do. I, yeah, I was going to say before. For those Go who ahead. are unfamiliar with Marcus, he is, as Brandon mentioned, a four-star safety from Bauxite, Arkansas, which is not that far from Little Rock. Uh, was briefly committed to Arkansas last year, reopened his recruitment in December. Coach Hall and the Sooners offered amongst a variety of other Power 5 schools. Marcus had Alabama, he had Michigan, he had Oregon and Utah, Wisconsin. But ultimately, uh, in the end, OU won out. We'll dive into that in just a second. But Marcus visited campus at the end of January, uh, came back to campus on Saturday, April the 6th, just two days ago as we're sitting here recording this podcast and not only committed, but announced all in the span of the same day. So he is officially on board as the Sooners 11th 2025 commit of the cycle. So if you do not know Marcus Wimberly, or you're just now hearing about him, that's the backstory. And you're going to get a lot of details straight from the horse's mouth here in just a second. Yeah. So Let's talk about it. You visited Oklahoma, I believe, in March and in January, correct? Yes, sir. Well, you... uh, so it was January 27th and then yep. April 6th. April 6th. Okay. Well, I, for some odd reason, I thought you were there for the March 9th thing, but you weren't. Um, I think, was that the – when did you go visit Michigan? Did you ever get up there? Was just I did. That, that. Yeah, that was sometime late in November. Uh, okay. still, still in season. I think it was just a couple of days before I decommitted from Arkansas. I got you. Okay. So coach hall shows up to your school during evaluation period. He likes what he sees, big frame, big guy. He throws the offer out. Originally they were going to wait till they saw you in practice before everything kind of went full blown. You go to the Under Armour camp and you absolutely light it up. And not only does Oklahoma go, yo, you just showed us what we were looking for. Come on with it. Everybody else did too. That was after you. So can you kind of talk about how that Under Armour game, uh, Under Armour camp changed everything for you in your recruitment and just how fast that happened? Yeah, for sure. So me and my dad kind of going into it, we were like, do you want to run your – he was, he asked me the question, do you want to run your 40? I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be fresh because some days I'm fresh, some days I get a good stretch and I'm good to go. And some days um, my legs are sore from a hard week of workouts or whatnot. Anyways, I get there and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to run it. And uh, so I went and I ran it, went through the drills, went through one-on-ones, great. And uh, next thing I know – few days later the offers just start to roll in more coaches start to reach out and I was I was like wow okay I I thought it was just going to be one of those camps that like you get a little bit of exposure maybe a couple bumpings in your rankings but no it was it was a really big deal and my dad called it he said son it it wouldn't surprise me if you had five more offers after that camp and uh, yeah. it just it just kind of kept rolling you know and, uh, yeah yeah yeah, now just kind of riffing off of that, obviously a big fast of that camp was not only the testing, but uh, the one-on-ones, the competition. And, you know, for you being a small town kid, that's naturally uh, a reservation that a lot of folks have with kids who play small town football is, you know, when they're faced with the best of the best and they got to go up against guys who have played high level high school football in places like Texas and Florida and Georgia, are they going to be able to hold their own? And so for you, uh, what was it about that experience being able to go up against some of the best wide receivers in the region you felt really kind of showcased what you had to put on display and helped show people, 
if you will, that, Hey, like my, my tape isn't just a product of playing small town football. It's because I'm really freaking good at the game. Right. Yeah. No, anytime I got the opportunity to go out there, matter of fact, I was kind of stealing rips from guys. I was like, you going to go, <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let me go. Let me go. And no, uh, but no, man, I just, I saw like, all those guys like, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of his name. R- Decorian and Moore. I got the opportunity to guard him. Um, that was a really good rep. I just I went in there with the mindset that I'm going to face the top competition and like it's my opportunity to prove myself to the people that still doubt me. And so I I took advantage of that opportunity the best I could and kind of showed out the best I could. So after that, you know, you go home, and you start to get more offers. At what point I know you really, really liked Oklahoma. I know your relationship with Coach Hall, and we'll talk about that here in just a bit, was really deep at that point. But at what point did you kind of feel like, okay, this Oklahoma thing is going to happen? Like they have really, really come along with the difference in how maybe they're they're coming after you. Did you kind of notice a difference at that point? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, shoot, Coach Hall normally hit me up. He was calling me every Thursday, sent me a text probably every other day. Same with Coach V. But, um, yeah, I I noticed a slight increase in, like, how much they were talking to me and whatnot. And it was – so March 12th, Coach V, he called me and said, hey, look, if you want to turn this chip in, then I'm going to let you turn this chip in. And I was like, oh, really? Okay. So I tell you what, I'm going to – turn in my chip on April 6th, but we've, we've done all, we've planned all these visits out. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to finish out these visits. And then on April 6th, I want to be able to shake your hand and give you my word. And um, it, it kind of threw a curveball at me when Alabama offered, I was like, Oh, that's, it's Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but no, it, it really settled in probably in the week of those spring visits that I took my family and I, we just kept on talking about it and praying about it. And it was like, Oh, use the place to call home. So pull back the curtain, if you will, to whatever degree you are comfortable on that January, or I'm sorry, February 3rd visit or January 27th. Or was it February 3rd? I can't remember which January one, but... 20, 27th was the OU one. So yeah, yeah, that one, that one visit that you ended up taking to Oklahoma prior to uh, showing up, shaking coach V's hand, turning in your chip, obviously it like you saw everything you needed to see on that visit evidently. So what was it about that day about that experience that kind of sold you on or helped sell you on Oklahoma being the place? Um, it kind of goes to a phrase that I kind of live by, like don't talk the talk, but walk the walk. And Oh, you like coach Hall would tell me all these great things about Oklahoma and the team and, this great culture that they have there in the family field and whatnot. And, but, you know, a lot of universities, they'll say all of these things. And, but really when you get there, it's, it's a polar opposite. And so when I got there, it was really like, he, he meant what he said. And it showed that family field. I was watching the guys in practice and Billy Bowman, he was helping coach up the younger guys. You know, he was correcting the other guys on what they could get better on. Guys were correcting him and holding each other accountable. That's just within the team. And then we ate lunch, and I got to eat with a couple of the guys. And I asked them about the culture, you know, out just away from the coaches, just what it looks like from a player standpoint. And they were like, dude, it's awesome. You have a brotherly bond with everybody that you wouldn't think you would ever have in college. And uh, that that's what really stuck out to me. And then the soul mission stuff, um, man, like I'm super strong in my faith and I want to use my platform to reach as many souls for God as I can. And so with the soul mission stuff, I think it's great. And I think they do a great job going and doing outreaches and um, all this community service stuff and these mission trips and whatnot, because essentially football doesn't last forever and you've got to be a great young man, mentor and for me, follower of God. So, well, let's dive into that. Um, you, you're very faith driven. Can you, can you walk everybody through just what you do for your church 
uh, the instruments you play, um, and just kind of your recruitment, how that played into it, I guess, like your faith. Oh yeah, for sure. So there was a point in my life where my relationship with God wasn't extremely strong. And, um, me and God, we like, I, I didn't want that relationship with him. I felt like I could do it all on my own. And there was one night he was just like, dude, look, you, you really got to get serious with me. And I was like, I'll get serious with you. And I, I prayed my prayer and whatnot. And, um, so a couple of weeks later, I got my first division one offer. And that was like really confirmation to me that God had a greater plan for than what I had for myself. And it just kept on going on about two, three weeks later. He was like, I want you to be a youth pastor or I'm going to bless you with a platform that you can, you know, spread the gospel to so many others. And what's crazy is my pastor's wife, she um she came up in the middle of church. and was like, look, I had a dream. I had a dream that Marcus is going to prophesy and spread the gospel to millions across the earth. And uh, I never thought that would mean anything. But now, obviously, it it means something and it holds weight to it. And I actually at my church, I help with the worship team. I play the guitar for the worship team and whatnot. I, I also play the piano, the bass, the drums. Um, speak a little bit at FCA meetings in Arkansas, um, at uh, the big events we have at the schools and stuff. But yeah, man, my faith is like everything. And I, I wouldn't be in the position I'm in today without God, for sure. Well, from Very that cool. standpoint, man, obviously there are plenty of folks that are part and parcel of the Oklahoma football program, you know, sewn into the fiber or the fabric, if you will, of the Oklahoma football program that share that faith. And, you know, it is, it is a cornerstone value for many of those folks. So for you showing up to Oklahoma and being surrounded by people who share that worldview and that passion and, uh, the desire to know God and to make him known, how much did that kind of enhance your comfort level being there? Man, that was the biggest thing for me. Like, obviously you want to practice and play with the best each and every day because it's going to get you better and hopefully turn you into an NFL caliber player. But that was the biggest thing for me. Like I, like I said earlier, I had the opportunity to play for Alabama or Michigan or Oregon top notch programs in the country, but, shoot so is Oklahoma but the biggest thing that separated Oklahoma from them is like you said is others is going to drive me in my faith and my walk with God each and every day because you can't you can't walk the walk alone Mm -hmm. and the biggest thing is like one thing I live by is you are who you hang around and so if I can surround myself with people that look at the things I look at the same way I look at them then I'm going to be driven to be not only a better football player every day, but get closer to God every day as well. Very cool. Very cool. I know there's some people that, you know, um, are listening to this and looking at you and going, dude, he is well beyond his years (laughs) as far as maturity goes. So that's very cool, man. Um, we were talking to somebody before this, obviously, um, and they said that we needed to ask you about your your track facility. Oh, <laughs> okay, well, our track facility is absolutely nothing, actually. We don't have a track. Uh, we don't hold track practice for the varsity team. Um, really, all of our track workout consists of is our football workouts, which is a full body workout five days a week. And uh, we, our track coach basically says, hey, you're fast. Let's go out there, run fast, and turn left. So that's uh, that's our that's our, that's our track routine. No, no working on the no working on the start. No working on form. You just go run, right? Just get out there and do it. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Tuesdays and Thursdays we do a little bit of stance and starts in football, so that guys that want to go to camps throughout the summer can run a good forty and whatnot. But no, other than that, it's it's solely football. That's awesome. I mean, I would would love to know if you could shed some light, uh, because obviously, you know, the decision as to where you play college football is ultimately in your hands, but you've got a close knit family, two younger brothers. They were all there with you at Oklahoma, mom, dad, and the brothers this past weekend when you turned in your chip. Uh, What 
what was cool about Oklahoma's pursuit of you through their eyes and what was it about Oklahoma for them that helped make them so comfortable feeling like, okay, we can, we can hand Marcus off to these guys for the next four or five years. In that aspect, um, I would go as far as almost comparing Harding University to Oklahoma simply for the fact that the values that each university holds, like my dad would say, say all the time. So me, so my dad and coach Simmons, the head coach at Harding are like extremely close. And he, anytime somebody would bring Harding university up, he'd say, I would have, yeah, he would have no problem with sending me there simply because the value that they stand on. And that was the biggest thing for my mom and my dad was like, um, shoot if I go to college I'm not obviously college is where a bunch of kids go wild and um, do all these crazy things but for my parents it was he's going to go to college and he's going to he's going to stay on a narrow path each and every day and so essentially that's what brought them to the decision of making OU home as well that's really cool so how often do you go up to White County Arkansas just curiosity not much. I, I've been uh, up that way a few times, but not yeah. a whole lot. Cool. All right. So let's talk about your relationship with Brandon Hall. Um, he offered you during the eval period earlier this, I can't remember, what was it, three, four months ago? How far, how long ago did they offer you? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, like I can't so, remember the exact date. January yeah. 3rd. If January 3rd. I knew it was the same month he visited. Okay, that's right. Um, you get the offer. It's only been literally four months and, what, five days now. So what, what kind of drove that relationship? How do you relate to him uh, on a, not just a coach player level, but on, on a personal level? And what makes him so enticing that you want to play for him? Because I think OU fans want to know because he's just been killing it on the recruiting trail. I mean, you look at the safeties he's brought in over the last three years. It's it's the best room OU's had as far as it, it, there used to be a thing, Marcus, you don't know this. But on the message boards, they used to say, we can't have safeties. Basically saying they can't have a safety. Like, oh, you can't get good safeties. In recruiting yeah. now all of a sudden that's what they get right and so what is it that makes coach hall such a great recruiter what makes him so personable to a player like yourself so coach hall he came by the first time my dad actually just stepped in dad when was the first sometime in december that's when he offered but anyways he came by for the first time in december and um, in January, he came by again, obviously, and handed the offer to, to me. But um, then he came by like three, four more times. And I was like, whoa, this is <laughs> this is way more than any other coach has. And um, it was it was like a, just every other week, Coach Hall was rolling in. Hey, Marcus, I'm, I'm stopping by the school today. And um, I was like, wow. So he's legitimately interested. And then on, um, it just kept on, we kept on building that relationship. He kept calling me every Thursday. And then he got to the point where he was reaching out to my dad at that point. Like he started texting my dad and starting to build a relationship with my dad. And uh, so that obviously meant a lot because he's not trying to build just a relationship with me, but my family as well, because they're obviously going to be a part of the OU family too. And then um, I definitely said, personally, he shoots you straight like no matter what and you don't always want somebody to tell you what you want to hear you need somebody to tell you what you need to hear and that's what I like personally is getting told what I need to hear and that's what he's going to do like all the time whether it's in conversation or in a film study or on the practice field or whatnot another thing is like him and coach V both understand what it's like to be an underdog and so like me coming out of Box Out, Arkansas, a population of 482 people, um, I, I understand what that's like being an underdog. And so mm-hmm. I can relate to them in that aspect. And the passion he has for the game 
Like he's not he's not there just to get his paycheck and walk out when his time's done. He's there to care for his guys, build great young men and great football players, and hopefully help them achieve their dreams of going to the NFL. Man, uh, it was, Parker, real quick, it was yeah. funny that he says he just he doesn't hold back and he tells you what you need to hear. That is the most on brand B Hall phrase ever. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, transparency, got to have it. And you're going to get it sooner or later, regardless of where you go play college football with any college coach. You're going to, the, the only question is whether that transparency is going to be uh, phrased in a congenial manner or not. Now, mm-hmm. uh, Marcus, I, I would love to rewind a ways, and you and I have talked about this in the past, but obviously it is, uh, it is pretty well known to those that welcomed you to the OU football family, uh, over the weekend the, you're, you're one of those rare guys that, uh, comes to Oklahoma by way of, well, at least partially by way of another program. You were committed to Arkansas very briefly, uh, from July of last year to December the 1st. Now, uh, for you, just being an Arkansas kid, uh, having that opportunity to commit early to the Razorbacks and then ultimately coming to the uh, decision that it wasn't the right fit, at least not at the time, and you need to take another look. What what was what was it that you learned along the way that you kind of carried with you uh, as you got ready to make the decision the second time around and ultimately pick Oklahoma? Um, one, I would definitely say is – patience and not making rash decisions so when I committed to Arkansas I was I was very impatient and I haven't really done this recruiting thing ever so like I was like oh wow I'm getting the opportunity to play for my home state and I've always wanted to do this so I'm going to do it and I didn't really think about you know what it would look like for my future outside of college and everything and um the more I kind of thought of that, obviously I decommitted, but after that, I really learned patience and cause there were times that I really loved the school. And then I would come back home and be like, dude, that school is so awesome. Like I could call that home tomorrow. And, uh, but no, I, I would give myself some time. I would talk with my family. I would let the excitement die down. And then once that excitement kind of died down is when I would, kind of start to think about making a decision. Uh, Another thing is, like I said about Coach Hall, is find somewhere that they're going to mean what they say. And, like, Coach Hall always says he's going to under-promise and over-deliver. And a lot of places you go, they over-promise and under-deliver. And that was one thing that I learned along the way was – that's something you've got to look for in a university and that's what Oklahoma does. So on that, you know, you guys, you went to other schools, you went to Michigan, you were committed to Arkansas at one point. What kind of made you kind of open it up and feel like, okay, maybe I need to, look around and see if there is a better fit for me at that point, because it feels like, and I know this because my, I got my in-laws and everybody are from the state of Arkansas. I'm there all the time. And I know just how devout they are with Woo pig suey. Everybody's a hog there. Right. Uh, there, there, it, it's a, it's a monopoly Arkansas state. Yeah. Whatever. Central Arkansas. Yeah. Whatever. It's Woo pig suey. 24 7 365 so how did that go over to begin with and then when you told everybody i'm going to oklahoma and i'm going out of state how has that gone over um it was it was really hard making that decision to uh back off my commitment to arkansas uh obviously like i said earlier i was really excited and made a quick decision but I, I legitimately love the state of Arkansas and the team itself. You know, I grew up an Arkansas fan my whole life. Right. But, um, you know, it it kind of – it really disappointed the Arkansas fans when they found out about the news that I decommitted. But um, I felt like 
you don't really know how good a place is or how not good of a place is until you go somewhere and see how either good or bad they are. And the more I started to kind of look around um, and kind of compare some things to other things, it, it uh, really like confirmed to me my decision on decommitting and then uh, making OU my final home. But there was no backlash like people like, dude, why are you leaving the state? There there are a couple upset Arkansas fans. You can look on Twitter and look at the comments. Uh it it's it makes me laugh personally. I know some other people might get frustrated about that kind of stuff, but I take it with a grain of salt, you know. Um but no, th- there's a little bit of backlash, but people's opinions that really matter in my life they all supported me along the way so right. that's really all that matters to me well you got calipari right like that's that's cool right <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge deal right now now man okay there's we've been we've been talking now for about half an hour and there's one question i imagine some folks are probably asking right now as they're sitting at home or driving in their cars that like i it's the question that's running through their head. And I feel like it's a natural question for us to ask you, you know, how was, I was a kid in Bauxite, Arkansas, a population 482 running a 4.48 in the 40 yard dash high jumping 38 inches or whatever it is, broad jumping 10, three, like, man, how, how is it that you came to be blessed with such athletic prowess and if you could kind of lend some insight onto what it is that you have done and continue to do on a regular basis as part of your regiment to continue to develop your athletic traits for sure so it's it's kind of like you said obviously god bless me a lot with a natural ability and natural talent but um i remember it in the seventh grade actually eighth grade that was when covid hit for me my dad came in my room and was like Look, son, um, what you're doing right now is not what it takes to go to the next level. And I always dreamed of going to the NFL and playing S- playing in the SEC and whatnot. And he was like, look, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Somebody's out there working harder than you, and they're going to pass you up. Your talent's only going to get you so far. And that kind of flipped a switch in me. And so I started getting consistent in the weight room. Um, didn't I didn't fully buy in at the time. And uh, so probably about my freshman, sophomore year, I really bought into the weight room and I started to see increases in my bench, squat, power clean, stuff like that. I thought that was really cool in itself. Um, But this year, I actually started to develop some discipline and consistency. And uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 6 a.m. in the morning, I'll go train with my trainer and uh, I'll actually wake up at four o'clock so I can read my Bible and pray. And then about four 30. Bro. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it it just really depends. I I do wake up at four o'clock, but uh, it really depends on like how long I'm reading or worshiping or praying that I go eat breakfast and continue to get ready for my day. I leave my house at probably about five, five 15. So I can open up the facility and make sure everything's open for uh, my trainer and I, and then for the coaches to come in later. And we'll train at 6 a.m. and then five days a week on top of those three days. We do full body workouts as a team from about 2.30 to 3.45 or 4, somewhere around there. But um, I also, right now I'm on a bulk trying to get to, I'm, right now I'm at 205. If I can get to 210, that'd be nice. So I'm taking in probably about 6,000. 6,000 to 7,000 calories a day. Um, oh, crap. <laughs> but uh, that that's kind of what life is like for me right now, just trying to get better each and every day. Because before enlightenment, you've got to chop wood and carry water. And after enlightenment, you got to chop wood and carry water. So that's what I try and do. Now get this, folks. This kid weighed 160 pounds when he finished off his junior season back in December. So, yep. Four months, he's put on 45 pounds. <laughs> That's freaking wild, dude. So let me ask you this. Um, you, you you told Oklahoma you were going to commit on April 6th, but you wanted to take those other visits, as you stated earlier. You show up, 
you go through everything. You obviously have already started building a rapport and relationship with the commits already at Oklahoma before that. But even with OU knowing that you were going to commit, what was that reaction like? Like what was, was it as cool as you thought it was going to be or was it better? Um, yeah, it was definitely as cool as I thought it was going to be. Um, I, I'm not the kind of guy to enjoy a fake everybody come in the office and just go crazy because I'm, I know I'm not the only guy committing and shoot. I, I don't expect to just go in there first day and blow everybody else out of the water. So coach, coach V, he was excited. Coach Hall was excited. Um, coach Caleb Kelly was in there as well. Um, but they were excited. They just, <clears throat> their biggest thing to me was they're going to, you know, recruit me just as hard, even though I'm committed, they're still going to under promise and over deliver. Um, they love me as much as I love the program. Right. And that, uh, he, he knows my dreams and aspirations are to essentially go to the NFL and obviously use my platform to reach many souls. He said, he, he promises he's going to do everything he can. And uh, to make that happen. And when you shake a man's hand, you tell him that that obviously means a lot. Mm -hmm. and so that that was the coolest part for me was the genuine um, excitement and the real, you know, um, feel of it all. OK, so making the shift from not only recruit to commit, but recruit to recruiter. Uh, how How much of a camaraderie has there been to this point with the other 10 guys that are in the class. And then now that you are locked in and now that you got a little extra time on your hands, man, how are, who, and I guess, I guess, I guess you should say, who are you going to be going after to join you in the 2025 class at Oklahoma? Man, there's a handful of guys. Um, I, I'm trying to get a Marion Robinson. Um, obviously he's a heck of a ball player, really great hips, uh, really makes great plays on the ball. Our, another Arkansas kid, so two Arkansas kids in the back half would be insane. Um, Lincoln Kern, he's a four-star tight end. Um, if we could get him, that'd be huge. He's a fantastic ball player, physical, big body, really big body. I think he's 6'6", 230, something like that, and a heck of a ball player. Then I know I'm a skill guy. I, I know skill guys don't normally talk to big guys, but – um, Landon Rink, he's committed to Texas A&M. <laughs> uh, he, he is such a ball player. Like, I don't know if y'all have seen it, but the OT7 highlights of him head tapping dudes and stuff, that's, uh, that's insane to me. But, no, he's a great ball player, and if I can get him to flip to OU, that, like, that'd be another huge addition. And so those are three guys I'm kind of hitting really heavy on. Them, Cooper Perry the number one wide receiver in Arizona, and then Elijah Melendez. He's committed to Miami, but uh, he's a number one linebacker in 2025. He is a dog, and we're actually pretty close because we've been on several visits together. And, uh, you know, I'm just – I'm really trying to get those guys because I know that straight ballers – and also I already have, like, previous relationship with a couple of them. Do you think Oklahoma has a chance with Melendez at all? You know, I want to say yes, because um, if he was completely locked in with Miami, he obviously wouldn't be taking these other OVs and kind of stuff. But he also, we were we were texting this morning, and he was like, "Dude, I really, I really mess with OU," and I was like, "Okay, that that could mean something. He could just be talking, whatnot." Yeah. But uh, he said he really loves what OU's about. He loves the coaches. Um, he's I think he's the number one linebacker on the board just simply because of how good he is and that he's got a good head on his shoulders. But uh, I'm going to recruit him, and he knows that, obviously. But I, th I think they have a legitimate shot if they can just continue to build the relationship with him. So this class that you're a part of now, right, it's, it's already, what, fifth, fourth, depending on the service in the country. Um, how excited are you for the next 
few weeks. Oh, um, without saying I'm, much, I'm not. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I'm actually extremely excited. Um, you know, just really all I can say is I'm really excited. I, I don't want to say excited for good news, that. right? Yeah, yeah, no there doubt. Go. There you go. I got one more question for you, man. Then we'll uh, we'll cut you loose so you can go get some sleep and get ready for that early wake up call in the morning. Yeah. But uh, man, you're gonna be back for the spring game, obviously. Uh, back on June 21st for your official visit to Champu Barbecue Weekend, man. What is your mission between now and the time that you enroll at Oklahoma? How do you want to use however many months it is between now and when you show up? Uh, to put yourself in the best position to contribute, get on the field early and make your impact felt at Oklahoma? Um, shoot, I just really want to stay consistent and disciplined in the training process that I have now, um, the Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Obviously, I have a little more time in the summer, so I'll, I'll probably go five days a week with that um, early in the morning. But um, as I just want to continue to train and perfect my craft because uh, – from where I was a couple months ago to where I am now, like skill wise and um, technique wise, I've gotten so much better already. And if I can just keep that same like training regimen, then I think I can go in there and possibly make a big difference. Um, now I understand that obviously I'm going to be a freshman and um, obviously I don't expect to see the field right away, but um if I can continue, like I said, just to work hard and keep my head down, keep building those relationships with those coaches, I think uh, things will be looking on the upside for when I get there. Awesome, Marcus. Well, we really appreciate you coming on with us. Uh, Marcus Wimberly, folks, 2025 four-star defensive back safety out of Boxite, Arkansas. Congratulations, man, and uh, good luck. Uh, throughout the spring and during your season, senior season. Uh, thank you, man. I surely appreciate you having me tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you. That guy, man, Marcus Wimberly. Again, thank him for coming on with this. Super, super mature. If you didn't notice that, and that wasn't the first thing that popped out about him, you're crazy. Like he is well beyond his years. It's super impressive young man. I'll read you a text that I literally just got from somebody in the inside the Switzer Center in reference to Marcus. Great freaking kid. I mean, different than any I've met. He has a light that I can't even put into words other than it's from God. That's Marcus Wimberly right there. So to kind of piggyback off that text, talking to somebody very close inside the Switzer Center as well over the last, you know, 24, 48 hours. Essentially, what was said to me was he was the most impressive human being they'd ever been around, which at that age, which is saying something because there's so many of those type of kids on that OU team. Um, they just said he was he was 18 going on 50 with his wisdom and his outlook on life and on top of that, they said he's a hardworking kid and he is, he's not a try hard. He's a do good. And when they say do good, they're talking about on the field and off the field. Like he does everything good. And so they are excited about having him in the program and essentially as a leader in the program, potentially even as a freshman, he may be the freshman leader of that group with him and Sperry because him and Kevin Sperry are very, 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 very much alike. When you think about their faith, when you think about just how they act in the situations and how they look at life in general, do you not see that Parker? Like they're very, you got oh, the yeah. defensive and offensive and they're both just super, super mature, which could make this class super special by the way, because when you have leaders that are like that, Everybody kind of falls suit, which is really good for Oklahoma moving forward because they have a lot of that in 23. They have that in 24. They find those cats, and which is essentially making 
this program move in a very positive direction, in my opinion. And it is moving in a positive direction. And the reason it's moving in a positive direction is because, again, and there's, I, don't, I don't know if there's a better example, at least better recent example of this phenomenon than Marcus Wimberly. Oklahoma has excelled, truly excelled at finding recruits. They may be local. They may be from far away. But finding talented football pro- prospects that have that combination of an elite athletic ceiling and elite leadership traits and a willingness yep. to embrace a culture like the one Venables and his staff have instilled at Oklahoma. And when you find those guys and you successfully pursue those guys, man, that sets the foundation for everything that you're trying to build. Because right. especially in today's day and age, man, where roster retention is going to become more difficult and also more crucial than it has ever been before, you're going to need guys that are, a hundred percent bought in to everything that you're about as a program for all of the right reasons. Yep. You got to have those type of guys. You can't always have the big NIL guys. You can't always have the guys that are just like those type of guys like Marcus Wimbley that are, you know, essentially top two fifty talents, but like they're also top 10 people. So you've got to have that type of combination. And, you, and, and you know, the funny thing is, I was just thinking about when you were talking. When's the last time you heard of, like, major trouble off the field with an Oklahoma player? Major trouble? I mean, Under like, fitness. look. Yeah. Uh, it it, it hasn't changed, happened. right? No, like, it has not happened. If we're talking you about... Remember like, the eight- days in the offseason under a previous regime when... You oh, kind yeah. of knew something was going to happen during the summer. You knew I, it. Like the last time there was any major trouble within OU's program was the night I was in the drive through of Brahms and watched Trajan Bridges get tackled by six Norman cops. Like, and that's been, gosh, almost three years to, to the day. So, and he yes, was a good kid. It's just yeah. wrong people. So, yeah. And of course, that whole situation with him and Seth McGowan and Mikey Henderson, that was a, yeah black mark on the program for a while after that unfortunately all three of those guys have turned their lives like they they have kept their nose clean and they have gotten a second chance in the sport of Mm -hmm. football which is great to see but it has really been since then i mean i isaiah thomas had a bs or uh, not bs he had a very trivial arrest in the summer of 2021 when riley was still the head coach jalil farouk had that very trivial arrest last fall other than that yeah it's very difficult to recall a time under venables where anybody has been in any sort of legitimate trouble yeah okay missing a court date is a little different than doing something you know nefarious (laughs) so like i mean that that happens to the best of the best you know so uh yeah it's just it's a different culture different type of people inside the program and it's not to say that there were bad people in the program underneath the previous regime it's just there wasn't the culture and the culture culture changes everything. And that's something that makes the OU program pretty endearing to a lot of people, particularly the fans, because you don't see a lot of extracurricular curricular activities happening outside the confines of football. So I think that's pretty cool. And Marcus Wimberly is a, Ryan example of that type of person that they're bringing in. So um, on top of that, he wasn't the only big name on campus this weekend, Parker. Oh, far. Yeah. The Heisman hangout had a slew of top talent that we obviously have on uh, OU insider. I I'll I'll open up because I know you've got a lot of people to talk about. Um, the most interesting one to me was 2026. I'm assuming four star defense alignment Taj Overton out of Owasso. And I'm talking to him yesterday. And I have to say, he's going to visit some other places like Houston and like, I believe like TCU and a couple other places down the road. But Bates has like 
he's made it very, very difficult for him to leave the state. Like you can kind of get a sense that he's coming back for the spring game. And then I don't know what happens after that. I, he doesn't really have a timeline for a commitment or anything like that. And, and most 26 kids don't, it's just kind of when he feels like it, but I'm getting the sense with Taj Overton that Oklahoma has put themselves in such a spot that whoever comes in after is going to have to gain ground and gain ground fast, or they're not going to get a chance. That's just my gut right now. You remember, just my gut. You remember after Derek LeBlanc transferred out of nowhere and we were having to talk people off the ledge with regard to Todd Bates yeah, and, to, and remind people, Hey, like th- this exact same thing happened with DeMarco Murray. This is the same Todd Bates that was the national recruiter of the year in 2019 at Clemson. Like this is yeah. this is not a dude who has somehow become washed in the recruiting game. And lo and behold, here we are in April of 2024, and he's really starting to flex his muscles as a recruiter, big time. Yeah. People needed to understand. We we said this at the time. We're like, look, I know David Hicks was a miss, right? I know that. Uh, Caden McDonald, you know, those type of deal. But he went from recruiting them at Clemson to recruiting them at Oklahoma. And at the time that he showed up at Oklahoma, Oklahoma wasn't really known for putting out a bunch of D linemen. They weren't known for having a good defense. Venables has been able to fix the defense to like each year, better, better, better. So now people are talking about Ooh, this Oklahoma defense might be pretty nasty in 2024. They could be one of the top defenses in the all of SEC. Look at all the returners. Look at all that talent. Well, guess how that was accrued? Because those guys, Todd Bates, Chavis, Venables, Hall, Vali, like they know how to recruit and they know how to build a defense. And I think a lot of the Derek LeBlanc thing was PTSD from a previous regime. And it was really hard to get that out of their mind. But now that you got David Stone, now that you got Jaden Jackson, right? You got you got one of the top D line transfers in Kane Woolard. You got the the year before that, Dejon Terry, one of the top defensive tackle transfers, chose Oklahoma over Ole Miss and Mississippi State. That's where he was from. Everybody thought he was going to go home. He was looking at T- he was looking at Florida and all those Florida State, all those type of places. And he chose Oklahoma. And that remember how surprising that was at the time. Because, again, we covering it, the fans, they were not used to Oklahoma being the team that surprised somebody, particularly at defensive tackle. And now you see everything's changed. And this dude could, let's just say that Bates could have a really solid defensive tackle room again in 2025. He's already got Kamari Moore. Who else will he add? We could be finding out sooner rather than later, Parker. You know what I mean? That's just the way recruiting works. The way things work, and I think our live could be pretty fun on Wednesday night. There's a plug for you. Watch OU Insider Live. On regardless when you're listening to this, if you're listening within the first 36 hours after it drops, you're in time to catch the live 8:30 every Wednesday evening. That is central yep. time, by the way. Yep. And we will obviously dive more into the Heisman hangout in much greater detail. There were 30 plus visitors there. Yeah. And uh obviously it was a huge weekend for Oklahoma, not just with the 2025 guys that were in town, but, you know, laying the early foundation for success in pursuing those 2026 and even 2027 guys. Yeah. There, the, the, everything that I've heard so far was that there is going to be some good that came out of that, that event. They feel like there were strides made with several 25 and 26 guys that they have very high on their board. And if that truly does be the case, I mean, you you have the spring game coming up where a lot of these guys are going to return Parker. 
for the spring game. Yeah. So within a matter of two weeks, you're going to have some big names returning once again back to Norman. And that sets up for evaluation period. Now Oklahoma is going to go visit them at their school over the next month after that in May. It shuts down to quiet period where they can only take official visits or unofficial visits. And then you've got June 7th, 14th, and 21st where all that talent that has been in Norman in March and April now is showing back up in June after Oklahoma went and saw them at their schools, right? During eval period, during spring football and all that. So there's going to be a lot of momentum. There's going to be some changes, Parker. People we thought were going to be in the class, maybe not. Oklahoma's kind of tilted in a different direction. Maybe with somebody ranked higher, maybe with somebody ranked lower. But it's all a fit now with Oklahoma. Like, they want fits. When numbers start to get crunched, it's always fit. Fit. It's quality over quantity. Always and forever when it comes to that. Well, and shoot, man. Oklahoma... I feel like I've been saying a lot, this a lot about the Sooners lately. They got first world problems in the 2025 class. Big time first world problems. Cause I, I won't say much, much more than this. We can get into it more in the live, but there's a, for instance, there's a defensive lineman right now that is not currently a take at OU. And I was watching his film over the weekend and going, Holy smokes, this kid yep. can play anywhere. Well, can't necessarily play at Oklahoma right now. That's how many, very viable options the Sooners have at defensive line in the 2025 class. And why, why wouldn't he be a take? Hmm? 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 Better go to OUinsider.com to find out the yeah. and know who we're talking about. Yep. So, um, so we'll, we'll dive in a lot into the Heisman hangout Wednesday. Like we're still accruing a lot, talking to a lot of guys, uh, so be sure you're there because I think on top of the day that has the potential of being big on Wednesday, we'll be able to bring information on that. We'll be able to bring information on the Heisman hangout. And then maybe, maybe there's some movement in the basketball porter portal as well over the next few days. Our man Brody Lusk has been very on top of it, brought some brought a bomb last night um, as far as a visitor that's taking place after the dead period, which is Brody is the authority right now in Oklahoma basketball. Yeah. And that's pretty unquestionable. Yeah. He's on top of it. It's crazy. And, and this whole Calipari thing, Kentucky, you kind of called it. I didn't really call it, but you predicted Brad Underwood <laughs> from Illinois. That, that was entirely tongue in cheek. If that happens, yeah, I take but, zero credits. Right, but it it's a it makes sense. That's the weird part about it. He goes to Kentucky, then what happened? Where where does he coach at, Parker? Where where does Brad Underwood coach at? The University of Illinois currently. Why why would that be pertinent? Because there's a coach in Oklahoma that it would make sense for Illinois to go after if that took place. Sure would. And then guess what would happen after that? Oh, you would have a vacancy. At, and we're not saying that's going to happen. It's just this, this Calipari thing, man, is going to open up a big domino that we did not see coming in the college basketball coaching world. I mean, it is going to be an epic domino effect. Don't you agree though? Like, Whoever they go get at whatever school, they're going to have to go after somebody. And then that school is going to have to go after somebody. It's just going to be just mm -hmm. boom, 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 boom. Well, because like, you know, Kentucky's not hiring an assistant from anywhere. No. Like, whatever That's... hire they make, it's going to be a loud hire. Yep. It will and be it's... a head coach and a good one. Just <laughs> this whole, it's kind of made basketball, college basketball kind of fun, to be honest. Like, the portal part has made it a lot more intriguing to fans, I think. I think the 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 sad part is, is they don't get to know the players as much as they used to back in the 80s and 90s, right, when college basketball was at its peak, right, all the way to about 2008. 
college basketball is a peak because players would stay two, three years. Now they leave after a year, the one and done, which Calipari started. And it's just gotten harder and harder and harder to, to follow college basketball. But with NIL, you're starting to see kids and players stay, right? Because they're making six figures. They don't have to go overseas to do it. They can do it in the confines of college basketball while they're getting a degree. And it's making the game better and better each year as long as it continues to move in that direction, in my opinion. So it's going to be fun over the next few years. It's going to be fun to watch what Oklahoma does in the portal. So, And we'll have that for you on OU Insider because Brody, like you said, he is the authority on all things transfer portal recruiting when it comes to OU basketball. Um, What do we want to, like, have you heard anything on the offensive line? Because I got some pretty interesting stuff. I haven't even talked to you about it yet. Last night I had a two-hour conversation. Um, I wrote about it on our board today, and I'll give a little piece of it. They have Jake Sexton working some with the twos right now. But it's not because he's a two. It's not because he's going to be backing up somebody. It's because he knows the offense. He knows the calls that Beaton Bow makes. He knows how he makes them. And they basically put him in charge of the youngsters this spring. And they're there, he's getting a crash course on leadership, which he already was good at. But it's it's more so because I think everybody kind of feels if Sexton has the year that we all expect him to have, he's probably not coming back. Let's just be honest. You know what I mean? Like if he's a day one, day two pick, bye. I, I and who could blame him at that point? So if you remember correctly, Parker, before or before he got injured his freshman year, what was everybody saying about him? He's not playing past his third year at Oklahoma, right? Yeah, that was that was kind of vibe very early on in Jake Sexton's OU career. Well, and he had a really good last that year. could be an NFL football player after three seasons. And he came along fast last year after the ACL. At the end of the year, he he dominated. He played really well at the tackle spot, filling in for uh, Tyler Guyton, right? So there's some high expectation that he's the next guy for Beanbow. But you want to know who I've heard has had a big step up in his production this spring as far as offensive line goes? Jake Taylor. Which, good. Like, that's one of those guys, if you're hearing good things on him, all day. All day. He had went and worked with Jake Sexton in January and February with their guy that they work with. I'm not going to dive very much into who they work with and all that because I don't think that's anybody's business. But um, the improvements have been pretty significant from what I'm being told. And he's battling Spencer Brown, but I was told that the gap between him and Spencer Brown is quite large right now. So if he can hold serve and keep that up, the two Jakes could be your starting tackles. You have Fabici at one of the guards. You're probably going to have Hatchet. And then they've got to find somebody because I know Venable says Everett will be back. I know some people that think that is iffy. If he'll be back to start the season. Have you heard the same? Oh, I yeah, yes. Suffice to say, uh, Venable's belief that Everett will be back before the start of the season is not one that is shared by many. I guess I'll put it that way. Yep. They better find somebody else. And then think that that's that it went from maybe going and grabbing a tackle for depth to okay. We need to go find a center, right? Like if you're Oklahoma, that's what's got to go. You got to go find somebody else to fill in until Everett's healthy, or at least to the point where Everett doesn't have to rush back and you feel comfortable. But 
here's the here's the question: If they do go grab somebody out of the portal, are you worried that Bates transfers? Is that is that even in your mind? No, I, I, I don't, don't think know so. Why it would be like it's year two for Bates. I I understand that, but everybody is quick to want now, now, now. It's a now, now generation. Sure, right. So. I, yeah, I think it's important to remember. Josh Bates is literally the only guy from that 2023 class that predates Venables. So he loved Oklahoma enough and he was committed enough to Oklahoma and not one specific regime or name or relationship that he stuck it out with the Sooners. And it was very early on in the process, right? Mm -hmm. He was only a junior in high school when that all went down. So he was sufficiently in love with Oklahoma that he endured all of that, which no one else right. did. He was the lone holdover in that 2023 class that stuck it out with Oklahoma all the way through that transition. I've, uh, the, the, just the has, Luke has. I, every time I think about him, he's like, oh, that's so frustrating. Because you think about it, you could have right now, you could have Bauer Sharp. Devon Mitchell and Luke has as your tight ends. Talk about nasty. Luke has <laughs> turned out all right, didn't he? Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah, shocked, right? he like, was shocked, right? Yeah, he's great kid, great family. All right. Um, be sure you tune into the, the live on Wednesday. We want to thank Marcus Wimberly once again for coming on here and talking with us. That was such a cool interview. Great kid, super mature. Um, but if you're not on OU Insider and you want to know what's going on with recruiting, you want to know why there's some big days coming up for Oklahoma on the recruiting trail over the next few weeks to month, go to OU Insider. If you want to see who OU is really pushing for to get an early start with in 2026, go to OU Insider. If you want to see how Porter Moser is going to fill out his roster. Go to OU Insider. If you want to know who's shining at spring ball, if you want to know who's doing this and that, go to OU Insider. The OU Insider VIP, we have it all for you right there for everybody. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of members already there that you can talk. You can start your own topics. You can discuss with everybody on there. You can talk to Parker and I every day. We will answer your questions. We talk to everybody on the board every single day. I do live chats. If you have a question that you post on the board, Parker and I will hop in there and answer it for you. If we don't know the answer and we see it, we will go find out that answer and then come answer it for you so you know what you wanted to know as far as what's going on in the OU program. If you love OU softball, if you love OU baseball, we have that for you as well. OU Women's Basketball. We got that for you. Everything's over there. OU Insider. That's where you knew. OUinsider.com. $9.99 a month. $99.95 for the whole year. We'll get you all the way to whenever you signed up this April in 2025, which whole season, all basketball season, all the recruiting, all the official visits, all the commitments, SEC Media Day, all of it right there for you. All the information. What are you thinking, Parker? What am I thinking? Hey, you were like looking out like you had a smirk on your face. Just think about Wednesday. Wednesday in general will be a very fun day. Yeah. And a be. great day to be a VIP at OUinsider.com. Yep. Yep. Um, also, subscribe to this channel. That way you get updates. Basketball, baseball, football, softball, recruiting, all OU, all college sports right here. I don't know you, Insider. YouTube channel great or subscribe to whatever podcasting platform uh you listen to us on we'd love to have you uh on our site we also love to have you right here listening to us because it helps us with advertisement which helps us go get that information for you as far as travel and all that type of stuff so uh helps us stay up to date so that we can inform you the listener and the reader because without you we don't have this job we don't. That's why we're blessed to be able to do this is because of you, the Sooner fan. So thank you so much. All right. Once again, thank you, Marcus Wimberly for Parker, for Parker Thune. My name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed day.